Welcome back. And um, as you remember, we were talking about uh, AI in games, in game worlds, and how we could use that to do player modeling. Um, now, for this uh, part, we'll look more into the actual behavior of the agent, the, um, the computer-generated agent in the game, which can be uh, controlled by uh, an AI method we call the behavior-based systems. And we also show how we can apply this kind of method to physical products, namely products like uh, playware and robots. And, uh, and of course, if we look at robots, uh, a lot of artificial intelligence has been applied to robotics uh, because there's been uh, this search and wish for creating intelligent robots uh, for many, many years. We, um, if we go back in time and look at the classical artificial intelligence, the classical way of applying that to robotics, that would typically look as, a, as we see here with a, um, a model that's uh, based on first the, uh, the, the agent or the robot would sense then, uh, something from the environment. Then it, uh, the system would make a model of the environment Within that model, uh, the system would uh, do some planning, and then it would execute whatever it should be. It would act. So we would say there was this uh, model of uh, sense, model, plan, act. Um, so that would be the classical method. Um, what you can see here is essentially there's a, there's a long way from the sensing to the to acting. Uh, when you have sensed the world. Uh, the system will make a model of that world and then start planning and acting in the model. So from the time of sensing something to acting, it, that can be a very long time, actually, even if we're just talking uh, uh, seconds. Seconds may be a long time if you want to control, um, control a device in, the, in a very uh, fast and precise manner. Uh, so essentially what happens when the system has been using its senses, it's uh, kind of blindfolded, and then it's doing the modeling, the planning and the acting. So it's while it's doing that, it's not seeing anything, it's not sensing anything. So, so that can be a problem that, that it, the system cannot be reactive enough to, uh, to act very fast to whatever may be happening while doing the modeling and the planning while when it, finally comes to acting, the world may have uh, changed. The environment around it may have, have changed. Um, uh, think of the example of creating, for instance, uh, football playing robots. Now, if you, if you do it like this, while the robot is, uh, is first sensing, let's say, where is the ball, then it's blindfolded and it starts to using all the time to, to model where is that in the environment, then it's uh, planning where it should go, and then it starts going there. When it finally goes over there, maybe somebody else has uh, pushed the ball away, right? So, so that's a problem if you're not fast and reactive. So AI ha has uh, also been looking at how can we create more uh, responsive, reactive uh, systems that, uh, uh, that mimic more what, what we see in, uh, in reality, for instance, in nature. Uh, and one of the things uh, we see in nature is that Sometimes complex behavior can arise from simple rules by the correct interplay. So having simple rules that combine create a complex behavior, that's more than just the sum of the individual rules. That's what we call emergent behavior. And this is well-known uh, biological phenomenon. Uh, for instance, from a flock of birds, like uh, when they make a formation, like uh, on the image a V formation, it's not like there's a centralized plan, a planner that has said, now this system has to act in a V formation. What happens is that the, the individual birds are doing some local behaviors. They are adjusting their behaviors based on what the neighboring birds are doing, but they are not having an overall big plan that they shout out to everybody. Now we are making a V formation, for instance, or any other kind of formation like you see on these images. The same goes for school of fish. We know also how they are, 
they're moving uh, around in uh, in different uh, patterns uh, uh, like this. And another good example, ants building a bridge like on the image here or ants building a nest. Again, the individual agent that we could call it here has some local behaviors, but together the uh, thousands of ants are creating something much more complex than the symbol rules. The sum of the symbol rules gives you something much more complex. You can even think of this in, in terms of cities and traffic. Another good example, like this image uh, from the stadium with football fans. Uh, you know, the football fans, when they're holding up uh, different uh, cards in different colors to make a overall big um, image. Uh, now, if you take a good example that shows you this uh, quite clearly is when the football fans are making the Mexican wave. So, you know, if, if you're doing this uh, thing, what you're doing is you're looking at what your neighbor is doing. When you see the neighbor is rising, then you also rise and you sit down. So this happens neighbor to neighbor to neighbor to neighbor around the whole stadium. And by that local rule, you're only looking at your neighbor. When is the neighbor rising up? Then I also rise and sit down. That gives you this kind of overall uh, behavior of the whole stadium making the Mexican wave. So this kind of uh, idea about uh, emergent behavior has been uh, modeled also in, uh, in uh, artificial intelligence and uh, what we call a subfield of that artificial life. Uh, artificial life is about uh, mimic mimicking life, is, uh, is modeling life in order to understand more about life. What we say with artificial intelligence is uh, life as it could be. So you're in computer models looking at how could life evolve in the, or how could behaviors be. And by studying that, you may be able to gain more knowledge about life as it is, namely biology. So a good example is, is that this that we talked about. Uh, here's it's a model. It, it's a model that's coming out from uh, Craig Reynolds uh, was one of the first doing this with uh, what he called Boyd's, these agents. And they have a very simple behavior like the one we talked about with the birds. They, if, if you just take uh, three of the, the most important small rules are the center, average velocity and velocity. So they're saying the center one is say, get to the flux center, average velocity, maintain an average velocity and velocity match the velocity of nearby uh, by points. And then there may be also one level, keep this uh, sea level. If you just apply these very simple rules, then you can have a, a couple of extra ones for avoiding collision. But, but essentially these are the ones, keep the sea level, uh, get to the center of the flock and man maintain the same velocity as the other ones. Then you get this behavior that we saw on the, on the animation here, the birds are flocking uh, around this and following this uh, target and, uh, and around the, the obstacle and so forth. They're keeping the, the flocking uh, behavior by those very, very simple rules. So imagine if you were to make a computer game, you can just, uh, instead of having to do a uh, drawing of each single agent, if you have a thousands of agents uh, that you need to, uh, to model, then you can just have these simple rules and then apply those uh, in your computer game and have thousands of agents following that uh, kind of thing, which we have seen a lot in computer games being used like that, but also in movies, in, uh, in things like, um, if, you, if you take um, a movie like uh, The Lion King, uh, where there's the, the wild beast um, herd is, is, is running, uh, through the valley, that's been modeled exactly uh, like this. So, so this is interesting. So, so there is a, a, a we can set this up as, as, a, as a kind of difference between the classical artificial intelligence and a more modern type of artificial intelligence based on this kind of behavior-based approach. We can say that in um, in the classical artificial intelligence, we have a functional decomposition of those functions, the sensing, the modeling, the planning, and the acting. 
Whereas in the more uh, bio-inspired approach, the behavior-based uh, approach, we have a behavioral decomposition. So we are, um, um, we are making modules of different behaviors, and then we have uh, th these behaviors running in parallel, and uh, there's a, uh, by that, a tight connection between the sensors and the actuators in each uh, small behavior they can have access to sensors and actuators. So there's not such a long time between sensing and active. This can be reactive modules. So put it more graphically, it can look like this. We have the, the good old fashioned artificial intelligence by the sense model land acting. And then on the, the right side, we have this more uh, behavior-based embodied artificial intelligence approach where we decompose into a number of behaviors that are running in parallel and each behavior has access to the sensors and to the actuators. So there's no symbolic representation in this, but just a lot of behavioral modules running in parallel. And you can think about how that can be an advantage also when you are going to implement your uh, your uh, games and, and your projects in, in the future that you can uh, maybe decompose into a number of behaviors. And then you of course need to somehow coordinate between those behaviors, because even if we say that all behaviors in principle have access to the actuators, we cannot have that one is saying, uh, turn, uh, turn left and the other one says, turn right, then uh, what do you do if that happens? Well, then you need some kind of behavioral coordination uh, between those different behaviors. And as you can see on the images here, even if they're a little bit dark, uh, we have four uh, on the left sides of these figures, we have uh, four different behaviors that are giving some output. And that output we want to coordinate. Say that one is saying, turn left, turn right. What do you do? If we, uh, in, uh, in the other case, we can have a... Um, priority-based uh, coordination where we have suppression. So the higher the behavior is in that, this hierarchy, the higher it has um, uh, power over the lower one, it's actually suppressing what the lower one says. So if behavior number one is saying turn left and behavior number two is activating and it says turn right, then it overrides behavior number one and it's that one of behavior number two that has the power and decides and if there's even a behavior number three it overrides what's underneath in behavior number two and behavior number one so beforehand as an engineer you have decided how is this hierarchy between the different uh, behaviors that you have unless you have a much more sophisticated system where the behavior arbitration is also uh, being learned over time, but but we can return to that in a in a later lecture. Another possible way of uh, doing the behavioral coordination could be action selection. So in this case, um, there could be uh, behavior number one is uh, suggesting one action. Behavior number uh, two is uh, suggesting uh, another action. Uh, behavior number three is. Uh, suggesting uh, maybe the first action again, and then the action taken is the one um, uh, that, has, uh, that has the maximum um, activation level. So they can provide different activation levels to the different commands, so to speak. Now, this kind of thing uh, we can say has been used uh, also for controlling agents in, uh, in computer games. I just take the example here uh, in, uh, in Half-Life. So in this case, um, what um, what uh, some uh, some of the developers here did uh, as a research uh, part was to do action selection, uh, where uh, we have this many different um, behaviors, as you can see here. Uh, one called uh, called run away or uh, move behind object or a charts behavior or an uh, uh, go to ladder behavior or turn to sound behavior, find enemy behavior, whatever you may have. So on every program cycle, the, uh, the 
behavior will be the one with the highest activation level that will win over the other ones and will be the one that uh, decides in, uh, for the agent what is the current uh, rotate, translate, and strafe value uh, for that, uh, that agent, uh, that bot, so to speak. And other, uh, other kinds of uh, behavioral coordination could be voting. So each behavior gives votes for different, um, different actions, uh, as you can see above, and the one with the highest will win. It could also be a, a behavioral fusion so each behavior is suggesting a certain um, certain uh, action, and then there's a, a fusion via vector summation. For if if you take, for instance, there it's about uh, the action is about where the agent should move. For instance, so if one behavior says uh, move forward, the other one says turn 90 degrees, then um, the uh, behavioral fusion by vector summation will be uh, move 45 degrees uh, up forward like this. So a vector summation between the, the zero degree and the 90 degrees, just to give a simple example. And further, if you have many uh, behaviors, you, could, you can think of those being clusters, uh, clustered to have meta behaviors so that um, there will be a coordination as a sum of uh, the different uh, three different behaviors on the top of the, or the sum of the four behaviors on the next one. Or it could be a competition between uh, the behaviors. It could be a sequence of putting behaviors, uh, saying first uh, the one behavior and then the second behavior. When the first behavior has been executed, then we execute behavior number two. So just to give you the idea that behavior coordination can be of many kinds. And, and of course, you will select the one that matches what you need in your particular project. Or it may be even a mix between these here, uh, the different ones that we have seen so far. If again, we think about the example of uh, that we had from Half-Life before we showed uh, here the other part where we have the navigation behaviors that would give you the rotate, translate, and strafe. And here, then, that would be combined with uh, the other outputs um, from the individual uh, behavior sets. And that would form a single action vector that is sent to the game engine. Now, this is, a, this is interesting because uh, this kind of behavior-based system where you are because where you're designing the different behaviors that run in parallel, and then you have the coordination that decides how can you act, right? So now imagine that you can do so that you as an engineer for your product, your game, or it could be some physical artifact, your robot, your playware uh, artifact, you as an engineer, you can design this different behaviors as we have here behavior one you design you design behavior number two design behavior number three four five up to behavior number n and then instead of uh, having that kind of um, uh, system to do the coordination you allow the user to do the coordination between these so you as an en engineer you have done the you can say the difficult work for the user you have provided and designed and programmed these individual behaviors you have so to speak made the building blocks in terms of behaviors for the user and then you allow the user to in some way or another to coordinate those to create what he or she would like to have in terms of behavior so this may be able to fulfill uh, some part from us you remember we were talking about the playware abc to make some technology for A, anybody, anywhere, anytime, by building bodies and brains to, now it comes to allow the user to construct, combine, and create. So you see, if we allow the user here to do the coordination, then we allow the user to construct, combine, and create in a simple manner, because you have already designed all these primitive behaviors. So all the user has to do is to work on a higher abstraction level and find out how to coordinate between these uh, pre-made uh, behaviors. So it could be, for instance, that 
the, the user is, is, is putting one behavior on top of the other and the way that they're put on top of the other decides this hierarchy that we talked about. So the higher one suppress the lower one. Or it could be uh, the other one, the sequencer, where the user is simply saying, uh, first we take this behavior, number three, and then you should take behavior number one, then you should take behavior number 17, and then behavior number one again, or something like that. So they make a sequence out of that. So just to show you how that this has been used, uh, with again, take the example of the, the first uh, Lego Mindstorms uh, robots. For instance, when we created the Pac-Man game, so we said that we create a behavior-based system running on this uh, symbol uh, agent. So when she is uh, controlling, she's actually controlling a number of primitive behaviors already running down on the Pac-Man robot and, and the ghost robots, they would also have the behavior-based systems running on them. So just to give you one example, other examples using that could be uh, when making fashion robots that should run out, uh, making a catwalk um, was made with the Lego Mindstones robot, art robots that would have their own different levels of uh, behaviors run around on a canvas and then uh, spraying out paints and painting uh, underneath and so forth. And then there would be an artist who would come and be able to coordinate those behaviors. So the artist would not know anything about robotics, engineering, and programming. He would know about how to make cool art. So we give him the possibility co to coordinate these uh, behaviors that are pre-made because then he can work on the high abstraction level without knowing anything about engineering, robotics, and uh, computer science and so forth. He just needs to coordinate to make, uh, make the art painting. The same goes for essentially the music robots. In this case, a number of agents, robots, playing with a behavior-based system, playing on different instruments. And then there would be a conductor, actually a robot here as well, sending out conducting beats to, uh, to the individual uh, uh, robots with behavior-based systems. So, so a number of different uh, behavior-based systems being coordinated between each other. Or in the more uh, complex uh, uh, part here with the, the Lego Mindstorms robots that we made for, for the robot uh, soccer uh, championship, the, the, the RoboCup uh, in 1998. This was in Paris during the, the FIFA World Cup. Um, and the uh, first time the Lego Mindstorms was shown in public, uh, each of these um, uh, players had a behavior-based system. And we had all first designed all these different primitive behaviors, like uh, find the, the ball, move towards the ball, move out on the left flank, uh, move uh, towards the goal, uh, uh, make a kick, uh, make a shout, whatever. And then um, we would, having all those primitive behaviors, it would be very easy for us afterwards to start coordinating those to make different player profiles that could then play in the game to have a coordinated action in the in the team of uh, robots, and uh, and then it would be uh, highly successful because it was so easy to to adapt uh, afterwards and and even test with different kind of uh, coordination of these behaviors. So highly recommended that you go in and you study more on the behavior based systems. Maybe the Brooks's subsumption architecture could be a good starting point for you to, to take a few details. But, but again, from here, take the message that you can split up in uh, behaviors running in parallel and then allow the user to coordinate between those. Or even you yourself as a user later on, if you want to change your your agents in the games or in your, your playware tool that you're creating, then it makes life so much easier for you. So uh, another example using that, uh, we used uh, that also as the starting point for creating um, our Wiki humanoids. Uh, these were the humanoids by which we won the World Cup in 2002, namely the Robocop humanoids freestyle world championship. Uh, so we won that in, in Japan in, in 2002, creating these 
a lot of these small simple robots, actually 11 small uh, robots. Uh, and, and you must remember back in 2002, humanoid uh, robotics was not uh, so far as it was in days so today. So this was really some of the first humanoids. And, and the big question was, how do you need, if you start from scratch, how do you need uh, to, how do you need to, uh, under, to create a humanoid robot in order to have the robot to be flexible for the use that you want to have it uh, to do? So for instance, uh, can we take the principle of simplicity that we talked about before in other lectures and apply to this, you would think very complex uh, situation where we want to create a fully humanoid robot. I think simplicity is not really, but because this is really, com you would think this is very complex to create. So we, we took this approach and said, how simple can it be to begin with and then start from the simplicity to add more and more and more. Instead of first putting down a lot of different things, we said, let's put up uh, in as little as possible and then grow it from there. So the first question became, how many motors are actually needed for making bipedal walking, for walking on two legs? So, so you can just take a few moments now to think for yourself, if you should answer that, how many motors would you need to put into a robot in order to make it walk on two legs and turn around and go in an, a, another direction, for instance? Now, it actually turns out that this can be, uh, be simple if you have the right match between the hardware and the software. You remember the B of the Playboy ABC, building bodies and brains, is about having the right relationship between the body and the brain. And here we, we are exploiting different qualities of the body. Namely, imagine that we have some spring qualities in, in the body as, as on the, the drawing here, in the, uh, in the angles of, uh, of the, on the, the feet, in, uh, in, the, um, in the knees and in the hip region. Imagine you have some spring qualities in, in the legs. Now, if you have that, we can make a prototype uh, like this one with just one motor even if it's very simple it's actually doing some uh, some kind of walking that's where we're starting from one motor shift the weight from left to right in the legs the spring quality so when the left leg is lifted from the ground the spring will move this leg forward then it shift weight onto the other side so the other leg will Will uh, move up and you can uh, that will bring forward. Weight is put down on that leg. The other leg moves up, and the spring uh, quality will make that leg move forward. And if you shift the weight, oh, this way. same motor to one side, then uh, the robot will start turning as well. So you can turn left and right. Uh, so actually, with just one motor and the right body. The body with the, uh, the spring qualities in the legs and the legs move uh, lifted up and down. Then le the legs will start moving forward. And this kind of embodied AI gives us uh, this kind of solution. That exploiting the relationship between the body and brain allows us to create a robot that initially only needs one motor. Then, of course, we start adding based on that knowledge that we had there. Then we could add extra motors to, to turn the hip uh, if we need oh, that, turn the way. arms more if we needed that. So it turned out we ended up using five motors and uh, strings to, uh, to move this, uh, a very simple um, tiny PC and then a behavior-based control. And as I said, uh, in front of 117,000 spectators in Fukuoka, the big dome, in, Fukuoka, uh, Hawktown in Fukuoka, we won the Robocut Humanuts Freestyle 2002 with this kind of solution. You can see one of the images, we dressed them up with, uh, with nice clo clothes as well so that, uh, that it looks uh, nice. And here you can see the image uh, actually competing against the one just outside the circle, Asimo and other complex uh, uh, robots that are much more complex than ours. But we take the principle of simplicity you remember Leonardo said, uh, Leonardo da Vinci said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. So here we make it much more 
simple, but that's actually the, the sophistication of our robots here. And the simplicity also goes with the control um, that we have, simple control that I will return to, and then the coordination between the material and physical structure. As I mentioned, five motors in, uh, in total, and then um, the arms, upper body, hips, and leg rotation that we would uh, have for that. Um, the symbol, uh, the tiny PC um, uh, that we had with an I2C bus uh, to the, the motor controllers and, and, the, and the sensors. And then a behavior-based algorithm for the control. So we designed a number of primitive behaviors, uh, for instance, would control one motor at a time, and then have we would con uh, have the coordination of all those primitive behaviors, just as we saw with the examples before, for the, um, the AI games and for controlling other, uh, other robots, we would do the same here. And this would allow us in a very easy manner to test out a lot of different overall behaviors and change those overall behaviors of the robots. Even if, if uh, the diagram looks a little bit simple, uh, complicated here, it's, it's actually fairly simple. A lot of different primitive behaviors that level by level are uh, coordinated between each other. So, uh, so we would have some actions, then some base behaviors, clustered into some immediate behaviors, and that would then be able to define the high-level behaviors that we could easily coordinate. And that uh, was very successful. So, so I encourage you to think about this and read some of the articles uh, about the behavior-based control and see how you can think about how you can apply that to your own projects. And then, as you can see, this, this is kind of a modular approach, the behaviors, the software components are modules that we are then somehow putting together, like Lego blocks, you can think about. The behaviors become a lot of different Lego blocks, and when you put them together, you're coordinating. So this kind of thing where we are splitting things into many modules, so we are making this kind of behavioral decomposition into many modules. This is uh, this we will take further next time to talk about modularity and distributed uh, processing. So, so I encourage you until then, uh, go and look a little more into behavior based system. I'm, I'm sure you will find it fascinating and then we'll uh, meet on this uh, video channel again uh, soon. So, uh, so with this, um, I would uh, just like to uh, thank you for now.